Turn with me to Psalm 84, and let's read this entire psalm together. For the choir director on the Giddeth, a psalm of the sons of Korah. How lovely is your dwelling place, Lord of armies! I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. My heart and flesh cry out for the living God. Even a sparrow finds a home, and a swallow a nest for herself, where she places her young. Near your altars, Lord of armies, my King and my God, how happy are those who reside in your house, who praise you continually. Selah. Happy are the people whose strength is in you, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a source of spring water. Even the autumn rain will cover it with blessings. They go from strength to strength. Each appears before God in Zion. Lord God of armies, hear my prayer. Listen, God of Jacob. Selah. Consider our shield, God. Look on the face of your anointed one. Better a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather stand at the threshold of the house of my God than live in the tents of wicked people. For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord grants favor and honor. He does not withhold the good from those who live with integrity. Happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of armies. Let's pray. God, we pray that even though we're separated by distance and even not meeting at the same time as we gather, that your spirit would be present in a very real way and you would teach us from your word. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Sometimes we get the wrong idea as Christians that we're sinning if we do something to try to make ourselves happy. Psalm 84 dispels that notion entirely because it was written by a man who was passionate about happiness. Just look what he says. In verse 2, he says, I long and yearn for the courts of the Lord. In verse 10, he says, better a day in your courts than a thousand anywhere else. He was on a quest a journey to find happiness. That's not unlike what we find in many other places in Scripture. Think about just the Psalms alone. In Psalm 37, 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. In Psalm 16, 11, we read, In your presence is fullness of joy. Scripture holds out joy for us as a reward for following the Lord Jesus. Our problem is not that we are pursuing happiness. Our problem so often is that we are pursuing happiness in the wrong places. We try to find happiness in the ways of the world. That might be by how much money we make or who we can get to acknowledge us or what cool new experiences we can have. Yet when we try to find our happiness like that, we're akin to little kids who are outside eating dirt while their mother has prepared a feast inside. We go on eating the dirt of the world, trying to find our happiness there, when God has prepared a feast. And he says, if you will just come to me and follow Jesus with all your heart, you will have joy unlike anything you've ever had out there in the world. We see this so clearly in Psalm 84. I want you to think about this psalm with me for the next few minutes because it teaches us to find our joy in God. And specifically, it enumerates at least three ways that we can do that. I want us to walk through those three ways together. First, the psalmist tells us that we find our joy in serving. As I studied this psalm, two questions came to my mind. First, I thought, what is the Lord's dwelling? It says in verse 1, how lovely is your dwelling place? Well, the Lord's dwelling is the temple in Jerusalem. And then I also wondered when I first studied this, who are the sons of Korah? It says a psalm for the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah were members of the Levites. You'll remember from the Old Testament that the Levites were members of the tribe of Levi, their job was to serve in the temple in Jerusalem. The Levites were not priests. They didn't have the big glamorous jobs, but much of the time the Levites had the jobs that might be considered more thankless in the temple, the jobs that might be considered a bit more grunt work. The sons of Korah in particular were singers, 
and they were bakers of the sacrificial bread, and they were gatekeepers in the temple. Not the most glamorous jobs, but jobs of service. When I think of the Levites, I remember years ago being at Saddleback Church in Lake Forest, California. I went into the restroom, and in that restroom, there was a guy with a vest and a little badge that said, Levite Ministry, Keeping God's House Clean. When there was water on the counter by the sinks, this gentleman would wipe it off. When the floor got dirty, this gentleman would clean it. I don't know how long his shift was, but it was clear his ministry in the church was keeping the restroom clean for members and guests on that Sunday morning. Levite ministry is an entirely appropriate name for that kind of ministry because it's the kind of task that the Levites did. That's who the sons of Korah were. They were Levites. And yet, as this psalmist is thinking about the temple, he says, I yearn for the courts of the Lord. I really want to be in the temple because if I could just be in the temple doing my humble act of service, that's where I would find joy. He's envious of the birds. He says, sparrows and swallows make their nest on the temple walls. And I wish I was there like the sparrow and the swallow, because if I could just do my act of service for which God has equipped me and called me, then I would have joy. It's a powerful reminder for us that we don't have to do something really big to be satisfied with God. It can seem at times like, to be really satisfied in God, we need to preach to a million people, or we need to win all our co-workers to Jesus, or we need to write a book, or we need to develop a new method of parenting that will revolutionize the task for others. That's not the case at all. Rather, it is in the simple acts of service that we so often find our greatest joy. What are the simple acts of service? It can be reading your Bible. It can be praying. It can be being kind and loving to your spouse. It can be helping your children when you don't feel like it. It can be faithfully attending your church. Those are acts of service. They might not be glamorous acts of service, but they are acts of service nonetheless, and they're the very acts of service in which we find our joy, like this psalmist, like this son of Korah. In fact, if we cannot find our joy in small acts of service, there's very little reason for us to think that God would give us larger acts of service and very little reason to think that we would find joy in little acts, in greater acts of service. Do you remember the parable of the talents in Matthew 25? Jesus told about three servants. Their master gave each of them different sums of money with the instruction that they were to invest that money while he went on a journey, then give him the profits when he got back. He got back from the journey and two of the three servants had done just what he told them. They had invested the money he gave them and received more. When they gave him their return, he said, well done, good and faithful servant. And then you remember the next part. It's what I want to underscore. Enter into the joy of your master. It was when the assigned act of service was done well that the servant was invited to enter into the joy of the master. And then the master gave the servant greater responsibility. So often that is how God conducts our affairs in life. When we serve faithfully in the little tasks, that's when he allows us to enter into his joy. And when we serve faithfully, that's when he gives us the greater responsibility and the greater act of service. Because why would he think that we would take joy in the greater if we can't take joy in the lesser. As I think about joy in serving, my mind is drawn to my mom and my wife because motherhood can be a thankless task. Motherhood means taking care of little people that don't always appreciate what you're doing for them. I have two sisters and a brother. As I grew up, I watched my mom take care of us day in and day out as a stay-at-home mom and not be thanked nearly as often as she should have been. And yet she was a person of incredible joy. I watch my wife now as a stay-at-home mom with our three kids. They can be challenging. She loves them so much and they're, they're so wonderful, but they can be challenging. And there can be a lack of thanks at times. But I see in my wife such incredible joy at being able to serve those three little people. Motherhood is a picture 
of the kind of service God wants Christians to offer. When we serve in the simple ways, we can say with the psalmist that, oh, we have so much joy. There is joy in serving. Find where God has called you to serve, the place that he's placed you, and obey. Even if you think it's small, you will experience joy. But the psalmist tells us not only that there's joy in serving, he tells us that there's joy in striving. Psalm 84 is not only about the a Levite who is thinking about service in the temple. Psalm 84 is also about pilgrims who are on a journey to Jerusalem to worship at the temple. Look at verses 5 through 8. It says, Happy are the people whose strength is in you, note this part, whose hearts are set on pilgrimage. These people are striving to go to the temple of the Lord. And as they strive through some of the difficult places of the journey, the striving brings them joy. Verse 6 lays this out so clearly. As they pass through the valley of Baca, they make it a source of spring water. The word Baca is Hebrew for weeping. The valley of Baca is a way of depicting the very arduous parts of the journey that are liable to make a person weep because of the difficulty. I think of the narrow paths of the rocky ascent up a hill to Jerusalem, the places where robbers could lie in wait and there was danger. In those very places, the psalmist says, the pilgrims found a source of joy. They go from strength to strength as they strive through the difficult places in the journey. What an awesome picture of the Christian life. The New Testament tells us in so many places that the Christian life is one of striving. It's one of difficulty. We could go to lots of scriptures, but I think of Hebrews chapter 12, where we're told to run the race set before us with endurance well, the Christian life is like a marathon where you have to press and endure to be faithful to Jesus. Keeping our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, the author of Hebrews says. We could go to Philippians chapter 3 where Paul says that he presses on toward the goal of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. The Christian life is not easy. There are extremely challenging situations in life, and we are to press on and be faithful to God in those challenging situations. It is in the very pressing on that we experience some of our greatest joy. I do want to read to you one scripture in this regard, and it comes in 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter's just described the salvation that... <clears throat> excuse me, the salvation that believers have. And then he says in chapter one, verse six, you rejoice in this, even though now for a short time, if necessary, you suffer grief in various trials, so that the proven character of your faith, more valuable than gold, which though perishable is refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you have not seen him, you love him. Though not seeing him now, you believe in him, Watch this, and you rejoice with inexpressible and glorious joy. Peter tells of the trials that believers face. He says those trials are refining our faith. And then he says that it's in the very trial that you experience joy inexpressible and full of glory. Why is that? That continuing to obey Jesus during the trials of life brings us joy. I can think of at least a couple of reasons. The first reason is that persevering through trials brings us closer to Jesus. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul says he got to a point where he despaired even of life itself, but that was so that he would trust God who raises the dead. When we get to a place where we're at the very end of ourselves, we have no option except to trust Jesus. We can't trust ourselves because we have nothing left to do. We can't trust in earthly reward because we're in a spot where no earthly reward is available. So we have to throw ourselves on Jesus Christ because that is the only option we've got. When that happens, God deepens our faith and he teaches us obedience in new and unique ways 
that brings joy. It does it without fail. I've never known a mature Christian who said all the best lessons in life I've learned in times of ease and comfort. But every mature saint that I've ever known would say something along the lines of the greatest lessons of my life I have learned in times of trial. The Puritan Samuel Rutherford said, God keeps his choicest wine in the deepest cellar. In the darkest times, we get to know Jesus personally if we stay faithful and strive toward him. That gives us joy. But striving through trial also brings us joy because it brings others closer to Jesus. I would like to share one other scripture in this regard with you, and that is 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 10. Paul was speaking about his own imprisonment. He said, this is why I endure all things for the elect, so that they also may obtain salvation, which is in Christ Jesus, with eternal glory. He says he endures his trials for the sake of believers so that they could obtain salvation. When you are faithful to Jesus in the midst of trial, you influence others toward Jesus, and that brings you joy. We're living in hard times. Right now, during this coronavirus pandemic, we're living during a time where the economists tell us one out of every five people in the United States is unemployed. We're living in a time when people have seen their friends and family members get sick. Some of them have seen their friends and family members die an untimely death. And in this time, people are looking for something that is a solid foundation during the hard times of life. We have that something to offer them. If they can look at you as you're challenged in your job, maybe as you've lost your job, if they can look at you through health trials and through family trials and see that you are still faithful to the Lord, that has an appeal. And they say, I want to know about that. Back when Romania was under communist rule, there was a high official in the communist party that came to faith in Christ in the church of Pastor Joseph Song. As you might imagine that coming to faith in Christ is not smiled upon by the Communist Party. This high leader was baptized. When he made his public confession of faith, that really brought the ire of the Communist Party. So they brought this official before a gathering of three to 4,000 people in an attempt to mock him, humiliate him, and press him to renounce his faith in Christ. He was given five minutes to defend himself. In that five minutes, do you know what he did? He shared the gospel with that crowd. For his boldness, for his courage, for his public stand, he was removed from his position. He was demoted to work in a factory, and his salary was cut in half. A trial. Nothing good came out of that, you might say. But after that, every single day in that factory, he said that someone would come up to him and pull him aside and say, hey, tell me about Jesus. They wanted to know what it was that kept him going during a time of such trial and such difficulty. People will ask you to give an answer for your faith if you are faithful to Jesus, if you strive to keep going amid trial and you don't give up in your Christian quest. That will bring others to Jesus and that will bring you joy. And the act of faithfulness in the trial will bring you to the end of yourself. It will cause you to know Jesus more intimately and that will bring you joy. The Psalm 84 tells us that there is joy in serving, there is joy in striving, and then it also tells us that there is joy in trusting. There is joy in trusting. Look at verse 12. The psalmist says, happy is the person who trusts in you, Lord of armies. Happy, blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord God. And then in verses 9, uh, verses 10 and 11, the psalmist explains exactly why the person who trusts in God is happy. It is because God is trustworthy. Look at verse 11. The Lord protects his people. The Lord is kind to his people. The Lord gives good things to those who obey him. That sounds a lot like Romans 8, 28. God causes all things to work for, together for good for those who love him, to those who are called according to his purpose. The Lord is kind. He is good. He is gentle. And as you trust him, you'll find that it's fun to trust him. It's fun to trust him. 
What does trusting him mean? It means listening to his word and doing what he says, even when you can't see how anything good is going to come of it. Trusting can mean being kind to an unkind person. It can be just little things like praying when you don't see how a situation is going to work out. Trusting God can be big too. Giving your tithe when you're at the end of your money and you don't see where the mortgage payment is going to come from, that is trusting God. Maybe God has, by his Holy Spirit, called you on the inside to go to a new place and do a new thing that, that you've never experienced before. Trusting him is obeying even though you don't see how it's going to work out. Maybe trust God is calling you to press on in a difficult relationship that just seems like it's going to hurt you. I'm not talking about staying in an abusive relationship, and nobody should ever do that, but I mean, what if God's calling you to stay in a friendship where somebody's sometimes unkind to you? Trusting him means doing it. And when you trust God in little ways and in big ways, you'll find that it's fun. When I was in elementary school, my pastor was named Brother Joe. Brother Joe's family was good friends of my family. He had five boys, and those boys were outside playing ball so much of the time. Now, where I grew up in New Mexico, there are a lot of flat roofs. In this part of the country, there's not a lot of flat roofs because there's so much rain that the rain would puddle on it. But there's hardly any rain in New Mexico, so you have lots of houses with flat roofs. Well, his two youngest boys were out playing ball in the yard, and he heard dunk on the roof of the house. The ball had gone up on the house and it was stuck up there. They came in and they told him that they'd lost their ball. And he said, okay, I'll take you outside and I'll lift you up, I'll put you on the roof and you get the ball. So he lifted them up, they got, got the ball, threw it down and they said, okay, how do we get down? And he said, well, you're gonna jump and I'm gonna catch you. And they said, jump? And he said, yes, but before you jump, I wanna teach you a word, it's trust. It means you believe that I'm going to catch you. So you come to the edge, you say trust, and you jump. So they tiptoed to the edge and kind of looked down and said, trust, and jumped off tentatively and caught them. He caught each of them when they did it. He went back in the house, they started playing ball again, and he heard thunk, 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 with all sorts of balls going on the roof of the house. And he came back out, and it got to the point where he put them on the roof, and they would stand way back and they would run to the edge of the roof, throw themselves off and yell, trust, and then have him catch him. What was so scary to them at first became a source of joy because it made them so happy to soar through the air and land in their father's arms. That is the kind of fun that we experience spiritually when we trust God. God says, even when you can't see how it works out, just follow me. Just obey me. And when we do it, we experience joy. That's not to say that everything in life is going to work out the way you want it to. Sometimes situations are going to work out in a way that's bad, that's hard. But I promise you by the authority of God's word, even in situations that are hard, if you trust God, you will find yourself in the arms of a loving Heavenly Father. And when the next hard situation comes up, there's no course of action that you'll want more than to trust God and end up in his arms again, regardless of the outcome of that situation. There's joy to be had in your life. Don't think that you're precluded from pursuing joy, happiness, fun, because you're a Christian. You are urged to pursue that. But the joy that you pursue is a higher brand of joy than the world could ever offer. Don't get caught in that but find your joy in God by serving, by striving, and by trusting. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that this psalmist was a passionate pursuer of happiness. And I pray that wherever we are in our lives, that you would help us to pursue joy and to find it in you. I pray for the person who is watching this right now, who is in a deep, deep pit of struggle and despair. Lord, I pray that you'd work out their situation. 
But more than that, I pray that you would find a way to give them joy in knowing Christ through the situation. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.